Sisters and Brothers of America. He is electrifying. And he's electrifying in a strange way because he isn't expecting to be electrifying. I mean, he, he addresses people as equals. He calls them brothers and sisters of America. And it's a legend, but it's a legend that has a lot of truth. It fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of all religions. And I thank you in the name of the millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. Before him was the power and dynamism of the modern West at that time. East and the West met at that point. Not just the East and the West, the past and the future met at that point. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. I am proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations on the earth. It is extraordinary because he himself doesn't realize that he's going to be electrifying. And he says, we are not servile. We have a religion that is equal, if not better, to yours because we are tolerant, we are open-minded, we are diverse. Sectarianism, bigotry, and its horrible descendant, fanaticism, have long possessed this beautiful earth. But their time has come, and I fervently hope that the bell that tolled this morning in honor of this convention may be the death knell of all fanaticism, of all persecutions with the sword or with the pen, and of all uncharitable feelings between persons wending their way to the same goal. Vivekananda captured the hearts, souls of America, and it was almost like a rock star. In fact, we have first-hand accounts of his speech at the Parliament of Religions where somebody documents women rushing the stage, sort of like if you look at footage of the Beatles in 1964, people, girls are rushing the stage. He is undoubtedly the greatest figure in the Parliament of Religions. After hearing him, we feel how foolish it is to send missionaries to this learned nation. He is a great favorite at the Parliament from the grandeur of his sentiments and his appearance as well. If he merely crosses the platform, he is applauded. And this marked approval of thousands he accepts in a childlike spirit of gratification without a trace of conceit. Every day for the next few weeks, he was in high demand. He spoke on Hinduism, Buddhism, science, religion, and the need of the day. Every evening, he would be invited to the most sophisticated dinners and salons. He was the bell of the ball, and everyone wanted to hear him speak. He called his audiences heirs of immortal bliss, and they loved it. The Christian is not to become a Hindu or a Buddhist, nor a Hindu or a Buddhist to become a Christian. But each must assimilate the spirit of the others and yet preserve his individuality and grow according to his own law of growth. If the parliament of religions has shown anything to the world, it is this. It has proved to the world that holiness, purity, and charity are not the exclusive possessions of any church in the world and that every system has produced men and women of the most exalted character. Just think about more than a hundred years ago, he's talking about the harmony of religions. Men were not at all in fashion to talk about that. He's talking about uh, bringing science and religion together, which people were beginning to talk about at that time. And he's talking about the most um, liberal and open ideas about the role of women, for example, uh, about equality of races, uh, about um, the independence of India. In the midst of all this adulation, Vivekananda's heart continued to bleed for India. The mansions of some of the wealthiest of Chicago were now open to him, 
And as he retired the first night at one such invitation and lay upon a luxurious bed, the terrible contrast between poverty-stricken India and opulent America crushed him. What do I care for name and fame when my motherland remains sunk in utmost poverty? To what a sad pass have we poor Indians come when millions of us die for want of a handful of rice? And here, they spend millions upon their personal comfort. Who will raise the masses in India? Who will give them bread? Show me, O oh mother. Show me, O oh mother, how I can help them. <laughs>